Hello. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Vic Amar, and I am the dean here at the College of Law. And on behalf of the law school and the entire University of Illinois, uh, I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the Paul M. Van Arsdale, Jr. Memorial Lecture on Litigation and the Legal Profession. Uh, I want first to acknowledge the law firm of Latham & Watkins, the Van Arsdale family, and Paul's many friends, colleagues, and clients who generously endowed this memorial lecture series. Uh, Paul's mother, Sophie Van Arsdale, who deserves special thanks, hoped to be with us here today but was unable to come. She is missed. For today's lecture, we are honored to welcome the Honorable Jed Rakoff, uh, who has served as a U.S. District Court Judge for the Southern District of New York since 1996, and who also sits by designation uh, from time to time on the Second, Thir Third, and uh, Ninth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. His resume and his accomplishments are far too voluminous to recite, but they are at least summarized in the bio um, uh, that is uh, up on the halls and is available. His topic today is how Americans are being deprived of meaningful access to their own courts. I can tell you from following his career and having had the pleasure of spending a bit of time with him yesterday that he has an extremely active and penetrating mind. And when you combine that with the knowledge he has gained on today's topic over his career, especially perhaps the last two decades, you can be very confident that we are about to hear many insightful things. Law schools today spend much time, rightly I believe, thinking and talking about accessibility. But law school accessibility, important as it may be, is a means to an end. Accessibility to legal justice for the people in this country. We can admit and train talented and diverse lawyers, but if there are structural impediments to those lawyers actually being able to assist people in obtaining formal justice, then we as a society really haven't accomplished our most important ends. I hope that in addition to diagnosing the problems, Judge Rakoff will also be able to offer some pro promising suggestions for reform. And with that, let me turn it over to him. Thank you very much. So I want to uh, thank Dean Amar for that very gracious introduction. I'm just very glad uh, that my wife is not here or she would demand rebuttal time. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I also am very uh, honored that uh, I've been asked to give this year's uh, Van Arsdale lecture. Uh, Paul Van Arsdale Jr. was a very fine lawyer, a partner at Latham & Watkins and also a great role model for younger lawyers. And yet he himself uh, died at the absurdly early age of 42, uh, reminding us, uh, I think, of the, not only of the fragility of life, but also of the need uh, to make every moment count. Now, in that regard, I need to tell you that uh, under federal law, I am precluded uh, from commenting on any pending case um, that is not just before me, but before any judge. And I'm also precluded from commenting on any issue that will uh, come before me for decision in the uh, immediate future. So that concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, not quite. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to read. Uh, 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 a lot of my talk, and I apologize for that. When I was a trial lawyer, I, uh, which I was uh, for 25 years, I used to uh, look down my nose at uh, any lawyer who read his uh, summation or his uh, uh, appellate uh, speech or whatever. Um, but uh, a federal judge, uh, unlike a lawyer or unlike a presidential candidate, has to be accurate. Um, and and uh, so, um, to make sure I am, I, I, I put it all down in writing and, and go to read a, a fair amount of that, and I apologize for that in advance. So here we go. Over the past few decades, ordinary U.S. citizens have increasingly been denied 
effective access to U.S. courts. There are many reasons for this. One is the ever greater cost of hiring a lawyer. Another factor, even apart from lawyers' fees, is the increased expense that a litigant must undertake to pursue a lawsuit to conclusion. A third factor is the decline of unions and other institutions that provide their members with free legal uh, advocacy. Um, a fourth factor is the imposition of mandatory arbitration. A fifth factor is the judicial hostility to class actions. A sixth factor is the increasing diversion of legal disputes to regulatory agencies. Uh, a seventh factor in criminal cases is the uh, vastly increased penalty for going to trial. I'm going to discuss each of those seven factors, but the bottom line is that for these and other reasons, everyday Americans with everyday legal disputes never get the day in court that they thought they were guaranteed by the law. A further result is that most legal disputes uh, are rarely decided by judges, and as uh, Professor Thomas has pointed out in her great book, almost never by juries. And still another result is that the uh, role of the judiciary is a check on the power of the executive and legislative branches, and as an independent forum for the resolution of legal disputes, has su substantially diminished with the all too willing acquiescence of the judges themselves. Now some of this may seem surprising to people accustomed to hearing about overburdened courts and overcrowded dockets, uh, but aside from the fact that these very real burdens largely reflect the decades old refusal of many legislatures to fund new courts and new judges at a rate remotely comparable to the increase in the caseload, a closer look at the changes in the court's dockets reveals some disturbing trends. Up through 1970, not that long ago, according to statistics compiled by the National Center for State Courts, the great majority of individuals who brought or defended lawsuits in state courts were represented by lawyers. But today, as many as two-thirds of all individual litigants in state court, in state trial courts, are representing themselves without a lawyer. Indeed, in some states, an incredible 90% of all family law and housing law cases, which are the most common legal disputes that ordinary Americans get involved in, uh, involve at least one party who is not represented by a lawyer. Now, people who are not represented by lawyers lose cases at a considerably higher rate than those similarly situated individuals who are represented by counsel. In mortgage foreclosure cases, for example, you are twice as likely to lose your home if you are unrepresented by counsel. Or to give a sort of different kind of example, if you are a domestic violence survivor, your odds of obtaining a protective order fall by over 50% if you are without a lawyer. While hard statistics are not available for every kind of case, surveys of state and federal judges repeatedly show that virtually all judges are quite sure that proceeding without counsel negatively impacts the result for the unrepresented party. This is hardly surprising. Unlike most European legal systems, the American legal system is an adversary system where, in Chief Judge Justice Roberts' words, the judge simply serves as an umpire determining which of the contestants has won the fight. While this may well be overstated, uh, the fact remains that very few lay persons lacking a lawyer's legal education or familiarity with the intricacies of modern law can hope to compete with a represented party. In practical terms, such unrepresented litigants are effectively denied a fair day in court. This is bad enough when the unrepresented litigant is a plaintiff who has chosen to go to court without a lawyer because she cannot afford one. But increasingly, these unrepresented parties are defendants, uh, 
who were hauled into court by well-lawyered companies and other institutions. For example, <clears throat> the most immediate impact of the Great Recession on the courts was a huge, huge increase in foreclosure proceedings brought by banks and other mortgage lenders against homeowners. These hapless homeowners, who in many cases have been inveigled by uh, mortgage brokers into taking out excessive mortgages on which they inevitably defaulted, were now subject to foreclosure without remotely having the wherewithal to hire a lawyer. Uh, thus, in my own home state of New York, almost one third of all state court cases brought in 2015, just last year, were foreclosure actions. And in these, despite increased efforts uh, by uh, various organizations to provide representation, nearly 40% of the defendants were without lawyers. Some of you may also have seen on, to, on the front page of today's New York Times uh, an article about the housing court in New York City where despite the efforts of the city to provide representation, uh, uh, a full 70% of the tenants in housing court in New York City appear without a lawyer. Now, most observers agree that the primary reason so many Americans are represented in court, excuse me, are unrepresented in court, is that uh, even people of moderate means simply cannot afford a lawyer. The provision of legal services has never operated according to free market principles. Lawyers comprise a guild, excuse me, a, a profession. Um, and uh, there are significant barriers of entry to that profession, including, as so many of you know, the huge cost of a legal education. But in the past few decades, the price of hiring a lawyer to handle an everyday dispute has risen at a rate much greater than the average increase in income or wages. Thus, between 1985 and 2012, the last year for uh, which I have data, billing rates for law firm partners rose from $112 an hour to $536 an hour, and billing rates for associates rose from $79 an hour to $370 an hour. Put another way, these rates were increasing at nearly twice the rate of inflation during the same period, and even more than twice the increase in workers' wages during that period. Now, economists differ as to the reasons for this great increase in the price of legal help, uh, but among the causes is a great increase in legal specialization. A corollary is that the family lawyer has become even more rare than the family doctor, but whereas the Ordinary American can still get decent health care through insurance provided by his employer or more recently through the government. Uh, affordable legal insurance remains a rarity. The net is not only that a very large number of Americans who go to court or are hauled into court are unrepresented by counsel, but also so that an unknown but probably even larger number of Americans who might otherwise seek legal redress for wrongs done to them simply cannot afford a lawyer and choose instead to forego justice altogether. Further still, even those individuals who can afford counsel rarely get their day in court. Rather, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they settle with their adversaries before the merits of the cases ever get tried. This is true even in federal courts where because of much lighter dockets, there is much less of a institutional uh, judicial pressure to settle. Nevertheless, whereas in 1938, about 19% of all federal civil cases went to trial, and even by 1962, that rate had only declined to 11.5%, by 2015, it had declined to an abysmal 1.1%. While the data for state cases is less complete, it appears that even less than 1% of all state civil cases now go to trial. 
Yes, some of the remaining 99% uh, are disposed of through motion practice, uh, but the great majority of cases simply settled without ever reaching the merits. Now, of course, it is often said that the early settlement of a legal dispute can be a desirable result, and that's true. But the fact that civil cases are settling at an ever greater rate suggests that something else is going on and is probably the great expense of litigation. The United States, for example, allows pretrial discovery. That is, as you know, the obtaining of documents, the posing of interrogatories, the conducting of depositions. To a, to a degree that far exceeds that of any other legal system in the world. While designed to achieve the laudable result of preventing trial by ambush, such broad discovery has proved to be excessively expensive. It thus not only places impecunious parties at a disadvantage, but again also discourages everyday people from bringing otherwise meritorious lawsuits in the first place. A special case in point are situations involving contingent fees. In certain kinds of common tort cases, as you know, the American legal system has tried to mitigate the high costs of legal representation <coughs> by allowing lawyers to enter into contingent fee arrangements with their clients, uh, under which the client does not pay the lawyer anything if the case is lost, but if it is won or settled, the lawyer then gets a substantial part of the uh, winnings or settlement. Uh, the contingent fee arrangement, however, has proved to be a limited cure at best for the problem of everyday Americans who cannot afford legal services. For one thing, contingent fee arrangements only bet benefit impecunious parties who are suing rather than being sued. Further, they are largely under the laws of most states restricted to tort cases. Uh, moreover, because the uh, contingent fee lawyer must hedge his bet by taking an inventory of cases, contingent fee arrangements only operate in contexts where the same type of, same kind of tort, uh, such as uh, a personal injury from an automobile accident or slip and fall, recurs frequently and predictably. It is also widely believed, not just by defendants, but frankly by many judges, that the contingent fee arrangement encourages extortionate or even fabricated lawsuits. Even apart from all this, the contingent fee is far from a perfect arrangement for impecunious plaintiffs, for under the ethics rules of virtually every state, the plaintiff whose lawyer is retained on, an inc on a contingent fee is still personally responsible, win or lose, for all other expenses incurred in prosecuting the lawsuit except for the attorney's fees. Such expenses include, among much else, the considerable expense involved in reviewing and analyzing paper and uh, e-documents, uh, the often substantial travel, meals, and lodging expenses of the plaintiff's attorneys and paralegals, uh, the cost of having a reporter transcribe the often numerous depositions, and so forth. In even relatively modest cases, such expenses typically amount to tens of thousands of dollars. Accordingly, many people who might otherwise hire a lawyer under a contingent fee arrangement are deterred from doing so by the prospect of having to pay expenses, and still others settle their cases early or for less than they might otherwise obtain in order to avoid exorbitant expenses. So even in the special case of contingent fees, many parties are effectively priced out of having a real day in court. Another way in which the average American used to be able to afford a lawyer was by having one provided by an organization to which the person belonged, most commonly a union. Any uh, person who has ever witnessed, for example, a lawyer is provided by uh, unions to their police, to, by police unions to their members, uh, know how very skilled and effective uh, these institutional lawyers can be. But over the past few decades, the percentage of Americans working in the private sector who are unionized has steadily declined. Uh, by 1983, which is the first year for which I was able to find hard data, uh, the private uh, worker unionization rate was already down to 11.9%. And, and by 2015, last year, it was all the way down to 6.7%. Uh, uh, 
In other words, only a tiny fraction of the private workforce uh, is unionized. So while the benefit of union-paid legal representation uh, is available to them, it's not available to the overwhelming majority uh, of private workers. Now, so far I've been describing how the average American is increasingly priced out of legal services. Uh, but equally troublesome is the degree to which most Americans are being forced to agree to one-sided contracts that deprive them from going to court altogether. So, for example, employees in an ever-growing number of industries must agree as a condition of their employment to contractual provisions that mandate that any legal dispute related to their employment must be decided by a private arbitrator. Similarly, consumers who purchase goods or services online are increasingly subject to terms and conditions unilaterally drafted by the seller's lawyers that provide, among much else, that they must forgo their legal right to go to court as well as their constitutional uh, right to a jury uh, and instead have any and all disputes settled by a private arbitrator. I am quite sure that every single person in this audience has entered into such an agreement, maybe even without knowing it. The private arbitrator, by the way, is not only typically chosen and paid for by the employer or the seller, but is also free to proceed with little or no regard for the ordinary rules of evidence and decide the case without getting, giving any reasons whatsoever for the decision. The arbitrator, on the other hand, is limited in the relief that she can afford employees or consumers even when she finds in their favor. So, for example, the company imposed agreements that mandate arbitration typically also prohibit an award of punitive damages or the convening of a class action. The latter is particularly significant since the class action is, again, one of the few devices that the American legal system has developed to offset the high cost of legal services. In particular, if numerous people suffer the same injury as a result of a company's misconduct, but no one person suffers an injury sufficiently large to offset the cost of hiring a lawyer. One or more of the injured parties can sue on behalf of the entire class, uh, making the case sufficiently lucrative for a lawyer to want to pursue it, and making the outcome, if it is favorable to the plaintiff, sufficiently serious as to have a deterrent effect on the company. Uh, but this class action device, which most companies view with everything from skepticism to dread, is not available in a case before an arbitrator if the underlying agreement expressly prohibits class arbitration, as most of these contracts increasingly do. These agreements, foisted on employees and consumers, are what the law calls contracts of adhesion. Uh, that is, one-sided contracts imposed on weaker parties who have no realistic ability to negotiate, let alone contest, the terms. But this has not deterred the courts, and I'm sorry to say especially the federal courts, from strongly enforcing these agreements. A good example is the Supreme Court's 5-4 to four decision in the case of AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion decided in 2011. Uh, that case involved what was conceitedly a contract of adhesion that, among other things, required consumers to arbitrate uh, any disputes with AT&T uh, and prohibited class actions either at the uh, in court or in arbitration. Now, the California Supreme Court, applying California statutory law, had held previously held such provisions unconscionable and unenforceable. Uh, and since contracts are usually governed by state law, the lower federal courts in California had invalidated these provisions when, when applied to California consumers like the Concepcion's. Uh, but the uh, Supreme Court uh, reversed five to four Writing for the majority, Justice Scalia conceded that AT&T's contract was a one-sided contract of adhesion, uh, not in any real sense negotiated. Uh, 
and that the provisions mandating arbitration and uh, prohibiting class actions were similar to those the California Supreme Court uh, applying California statutory law had previously held were uh, unenforceable uh, and unconscionable. Uh, uh, but the Supreme Court majority nevertheless uh, determined that this California law had to give way to the broad federal policy favoring arbitration supposedly as set forth in the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925. A primary purpose of this law, according to the majority, was to favor arbitration because it was speedy and inexpensive, and a class action brought in a regular court or even an arbitration would be neither. Therefore, to carry out the supposed policy of the federal law, the mandatory arbitration and uh, uh, class action prohibition provisions uh, had to be, according to the Supreme Court, fully enforced. As the four dissenting judges in a uh, justices in an opinion by Justice Breyer pointed out, this result was inconsistent with both the language and the history of the Federal Arbitration Act. It was inconsistent with the language of the act because that act expressly states that arbitration agreements are enforceable except, quote, upon such grounds as exist at law or in equity for the revocation of any contract. The determination made by the California Supreme Court that certain provisions of the AT&T uh, contract were unconscionable was a classic ground uh, for invalidating provisions of a contract adhesion, uh, one known uh, to every law student here and one well known to Congress back in 1925. By contrast, arbitration as it then existed when the act was passed was almost exclusively a product of negotiated uh, contracts between more or less equal parties. And there was not the slightest hint in the legislative history that Congress had any thought of applying it to, con to consumer contracts of adhesion. Now the Concepcion case has attracted much criticism because of what many commentators view as its strained reasoning, which they typically ascribe to the pro-business slant of the court's majority during the Scalia era. Uh, but its relevance to me, to, its relevance to the topic here today, is to illustrate the lengths that federal courts are prepared to go in broadly interpreting laws like the Federal Arbitration Act so as to restrict Americans' access to their own courts. Uh, buttressed by such decisions, it has become endemic for companies to impose mandatory arbitration clauses on their employees and customers so as to deny them access to the courts as, to well, as well as to exclude them from exercising their constitutional right to a jury. In addition, most of these clauses now also forbid the bringing of class actions either at, in court or in arbitration. It is not just the courts who are to blame for thereby limiting access to the courts. Congress, under both Democrats and Republicans, has not been shy about enacting all kinds of laws restricting such access. An extreme example is the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act enacted with bipartisan support in 1996, which severely restricts the ability of a state prisoner to obtain the federal judicial review of his conviction historically embodied in the great writ of habeas corpus. Uh, but a less noticed, noticed example that actually affects many more average citizens is Congress's increasing delegation of judicial powers and responsibilities to administrative agencies. Without any obvious support from the Constitution, these agencies, which are branches of the executive, then create their own internal courts with procedures that bear little resemblance to those found in constitutional courts. Furthermore, these administrative courts are run by judges who are selected by, paid by, and subject to review by the administrative agencies themselves. Yet Congress, often at the behest of the president, has given these courts of doubtful independence increasing powers. For example, as 
Professor Thomas pointed out in her lecture yesterday, I hope many of you attended, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 greatly expanded the powers of the SEC's administrative courts, and the SEC in turn has increasingly brought more and more of its important cases in its uh, administrative courts, where, not surprisingly, its success rate is considerably greater than its success rate in federal courts. Thus, in the years between 2010 and 2015, the SEC won 90% of its cases in its own administrative courts, compared with 67% of its cases in federal courts. For its part, the Supreme Court has carefully, excuse me, has greatly limited its effective review of these administrative courts. In particular, the court's 1984 decision in Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council, which severely limited the scope of judicial review of administrative rules, has been extended to an agency's judicial decisions in any case where the administrative agency has itself affirmed the decision of its administrative court. So consider how this works. The SEC, for example, used to bring uh, all its insider trading cases in federal court, uh, but now brings some of them uh, in its own administrative courts. The administrative law ju judges, selected by and paid by the SEC, then interpret the applicable regulations, most often in a way favorable to the SEC. The defendant must then, in the first instance, appeal that decision if he wants to appeal it at all, to the Securities and Exchange Commission itself, the very body that authorized the bringing of the lawsuit against him. And if the commission approves the administrative law judge's decision, which it almost always does, the federal courts under Chevron may overturn that decision only if the decision embodies an interpretation of the relevant regulations that no reasonable person could hold. The overall effect, once again, is to deprive ordinary citizens of meaningful access to regular courts. While US citizens thus have no longer have much real access to the courts in civil and administrative matters, you might think that the one area where they would still have meaningful access would be in criminal cases, which are beyond the jurisdiction of any administrative court, let alone private uh, administrators, but not so. In reality, the real decision in criminal cases are made by the prosecutors, not by the courts. This is because as a result of draconian and often mandatory penalties imposed by both Congress and most state legislatures during the last decades of the 20th century, it has become much too risky for any defendant, even an innocent one, to go to trial. Instead, over 90% excuse me, over 97% of those charged in federal criminal cases negotiate plea bargains with the prosecution. And in the states, uh, that's the uh, federal uh, statistic in the states, it's only slightly less, about 95%. In most cases, as a practical matter, and sometimes as a legally binding matter as well, the terms of the plea bargain also determine the sentence to be imposed. So there's nothing left for either a judge or a jury to do. While the immediate result is the mass incarceration in the United States that has rightly become a source of shame to all thinking Americans, the effect can also be seen as just one more example of the effective denial of meaningful access to the courts. Now, can anything be done about this increasing denial of access? A number of solutions have been proposed, ranging from state-sponsored legal insurance to a guarantee of counsel to, individual, to indigent civil litigants to lawyer-subsidized provision of cheaper legal services for everyday Americans and so forth. Given the current gridlock in Congress and the history in state legislatures of shortchanging legal aid groups, one cannot be very optimistic about such legislative solutions. But just as the impetus for a criminally accused person's right to counsel came from the Supreme Court's decision in the Gideon case, so I am convinced that it is up to the courts 
to begin considering whether devices that effectively deny Americans access to their courts may be deemed unlawful. Consider, conceitedly, this will require a considerable change of thought on the part of many judges. Indeed, it is hardly surprising that judges, who often have substantial dockets, tend to look favorably on arrangements that will lessen their work burden, whether it is by mandatory arbitration, denial of jurisdiction, reliance on prosecutors and administrators, etc. Too often, however, this morphs into an effective reduction of judicial responsibility with dire consequences to the long-term role of the courts in serving as an effective check on the power of the legislature and the executive. Arguably even worse, it reinforces the belief of everyday citizens that the courts are not an institution to which they can turn for justice, but are simply a remote and expensive luxury reserved for the rich and powerful. If the judges themselves do not take steps to counter this insidious trend, who will? Thank you very much.